you're looking at a galaxy through a telescope, or what is more likely, at a photograph of a galaxy. And then it turns out that it all was a lie. Not in the sense that it's a hologram or some fake image. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. I mean that you might be seeing not a galaxy, but rather an anti-galaxy, or a galaxy made of antimatter. Sounds science fiction-y, but in reality it may be not as bizarre as it sounds. Antimatter definitely exists. We register it in space and we are even able to create it in a lab. Most of its parameters are identical with regular matter. More than that, if such a hypothetical galaxy existed in some isolated region of space and if we found it, we might not even be able to tell it apart from a regular galaxy. So yes, at least in theory, a faraway galaxy that we are seeing could be an imposter. But that's the theory. Let's talk in more detail whether antimatter galaxies, anti-stars or other objects could exist and if we could detect them. And also we're gonna talk about antimatter itself. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. I'm made of regular matter, and I hope so are you. As well as the moon, earth, the sun, and so on. Aren't there too many kinds of matter? Regular matter, antimatter, dark matter? Actually, situations with dark matter and antimatter are different. Yes, scientists believe that both of them exist. In the case of dark matter, the hidden mass of the universe, we know that the mass is there. For instance, we can see how it gravitationally affects regular matter. But we are still not sure what the hidden matter is, though there are some ideas. It could be unknown kinds of particles, or there are also more conservative ideas. That it could be brown dwarfs or black holes. Both of these hypotheses are not the leading ones. So what I want to say is that we know that the mass is there, but we don't know what it is. But it's different with antimatter. We are very much aware what antimatter particles are. We can see them or their effects in experiments and can create antimatter in labs. And it's more than that. Many of you probably had to deal with antimatter sometimes without even knowing. So what's the difference between regular matter and antimatter? Well, it doesn't look like that there is that big of a difference. Today it's believed that most particles have their antiparticle companions. And most of their parameters are identical. Most, but not all of them. The most typical example here is an electron. Its antiparticle is a positron. They have identical mass, spin, but the charge is the opposite. Electrons have a negative charge and the positrons positive. An antiparticle of a proton that has a positive charge is an antiproton that has a negative charge. The difference between a neutron and an antineutron that are electrically neutral is magnetic moment. Also, even though you can see illustrations of atoms similar to this one, where the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and they are surrounded by electrons or an electron cloud, now we know it's not the end of the story and the protons and neutrons are made of quarks. Actually, it's even more complicated than that. So a neutron is made of one up or u quark and two d or down quarks, whereas an antineutron is made of one up antiquark and two down antiquarks. You might have seen this table of the standard module of elementary particles, but we don't see antiparticles here. And this is what it would look like with antiparticles included. It's not uncommon that before the actual discovery comes a theoretical prediction, and in this case it can be even called unintended. A theoretical physicist Paul Dirac worked on combining quantum mechanics and special relativity. To be more specific, he created an equation that described the behavior of an electron moving with relativistic speed or near light speed in electric and magnetic fields. Today this equation is known as, well, Dirac's equation. It is so significant that some people even tattoo some of its forms on their bodies. Well, okay, that's not the best indicator, but still. Actually, Paul Dirac's work was so important for physics that he was even called by some people the greatest theoretical physicist since Isaac Newton. In 1933, he shared a Nobel Prize in physics with Erwin Schrödinger. But what does it have to do with antimatter? It turned out that Dirac's equation for an electron had not one, but two solutions. And the second solution described a particle almost identical to an electron, but with an opposite charge a particle that we now call a positron. Back then there were ideas that the second solution just showed that quantum theory was just wrong or incomplete, and many scientists were skeptical to the idea of antiparticles. But Dirac called his equation, quote, beautiful, unquote. 
and he proposed the idea that all of the particles have to have antiparticle counterparts, and that the additional solution had to have a physical meaning. But the experimental evidence came very soon. Dirac wrote down his equation in 1928, and in 1931 came the experimental evidence. The experiment was performed by Carl David Anderson. By the way, he also won a Nobel Prize. So he used the Wilson Cloud Chamber, a device used for detecting ionizing particles. It's basically a vessel with supersaturated liquid or vapor. When a particle gets inside, it ionizes the material and along its trajectory condensation occurs. So we don't actually see microscopic particles themselves. What we do see is tracks they leave on their way. Studying those tracks, we can learn about the parameters of particles. This is what it looks like in action. Peter Kapitza, another Nobel laureate, came up with the idea to put a cloud chamber in a strong magnetic field. That would bend particle trajectories, which gives even more information, specifically about the charge. Anderson, using a cloud chamber in the magnetic field, studied cosmic rays, charged particles that arrive from various cosmic sources. And he made a photo of this. It's a particle track. We can see that because of the magnetic field, the trajectory is bent. That's all nice and neat, but the properties of the track tell us that it was left by a particle with the properties of an electron. Except for one thing. It's bent in the opposite direction, which means it had an opposite charge. That was the first experimental evidence for the existence of antiparticle. A positron in this case. And it was just the beginning. Nowadays, antiparticles are routinely created in laboratories, for instance, in the particle accelerators. And not only the subatomic particles are created, even the whole anti-atoms. There is one important thing that I have managed to avoid so far. When a particle collides with its antiparticle, they annihilate, leaving only pure energy. And that's a big problem, which we'll get back to. The contact of one gram of antimatter with a gram of matter can create so much energy that it would be comparable with the nuclear explosion of several kilotons. If you've read a book or watched the movie Angels and Demons, you may remember that the plot there revolved around an antimatter bomb. Antimatter in the book was created in CERN, where it actually gets made. But in reality, in quantities way smaller than necessary for such a bomb. Also, it's not quite realistic that so much antimatter is kept for so long in a portable container that small. Star Trek fans know that matter, antimatter annihilation is used there to propel starships. But that's fiction. And yet you can meet antimatter in everyday life. The experiment I've told you about detected a cosmic ray antiparticle. So, antiparticles from astrophysical sources hit the Earth on a regular basis. Perhaps one antiparticle went right through you right now, if it hadn't collided with anything before that. But you wouldn't notice the energy from a single pair annihilation. Antimatter may be created in thunderstorms. You might have heard of PET or positron emission tomography. A radioactive substance is injected in a person's body. Positrons form in a radioactive decay and when they meet electrons they annihilate and gamma rays are produced, which allows to create images like these. You know what else creates antimatter? This? That's right, bananas contain a tiny amount of potassium-40. It's a radioactive isotope. But don't worry about radioactive killer bananas. So when potassium-40 decays, it produces one positron. On average, one banana can create one antiparticle every 75 minutes. So when the next time you get together with your friends to eat some bananas, you can show off with this fact. But for this, you actually don't even need a banana party. There is some potassium-40 in our bodies, so we ourselves are antimatter factors in a sense. Some antimatter is found in space. By the way, the fact that there is very little antimatter in the universe is related to the one of the biggest modern problems of cosmology. So far, we mostly talked about antimatter particles. For now, let's ignore the matter-antimatter problem and let's just see if macroscopic objects made of antimatter are even possible. At a first glance, based on what I've been saying so far, the answer that comes to mind is yes. And that may be true. Except for the charge and some other parameters in some cases, matter and antimatter are almost identical. 
Furthermore, scientists already create antiatoms, so why can't there be something bigger made of those antiatoms? Antiparticles have the same mass, and general relativity predicts that gravity should work the same for antimatter. If it is the case, and let's say there were some isolated region of the universe where antimatter dominated, perhaps antistars, antiplanets, and even antihumans could be there. So at this point, the existence of antigalaxies seems plausible. But there is a catch. There is a lot we don't know about antimatter particles. It's quite hard to study it. For instance, we don't know for sure how gravity affects antimatter. Even though it should behave the same way as for regular matter, it has not been definitively confirmed in an experiment. So there is at least some chance that antimatter doesn't get pulled under gravity, but rather gets pushed away. Then the question of anti-star's formation becomes not that straightforward. In the CERN experiment Aegis, scientists are trying to create anti-hydrogen atoms that live long enough to be able to study their behavior under gravity. So we don't have an answer yet, but we probably will. But let's talk a little about tiny problem of matter and antimatter asymmetry. To be honest, it's a topic for a whole separate video, but we can't ignore it completely. I've already talked about annihilation, but there is also an opposite process in which particle-antiparticle pair forms. The idea is that right after the Big Bang, an equal amount of matter and antimatter had to be created from energy. But if it is the case and all of the particles were created in pairs, then all of them had to mutually annihilate. And then the universe would be a pretty boring place. No matter, no planets, stars, galaxies, only energy. Obviously, no, it's not the case. We live in the universe where regular matter dominates, and only some antimatter is created in some astrophysical events. The general explanation is usually this. In the early universe, the amount of matter and antimatter was not equal, but slightly different. For some reason, there was a little more regular matter. Almost everything actually annihilated, and what was left is what we see now. Only one particle in a billion survived and everything we see today is made of that tiny fraction. That's the baryon asymmetry problem. One of the biggest unsolved problems of cosmology. We don't really know why we live in the universe where regular matter dominates. We don't know what happened that eventually allowed our own existence. There are several hypotheses, but there is one especially interesting to us in the context of anti-galaxies. What if there actually was an equal amount of matter and antimatter, but in the early expanding universe they formed separate clumps and became divided? That's why there was no annihilation. Then we would live in the region of space where normal matter dominated, but also somewhere there could be a region where antimatter dominated. We have galaxies, they have anti-galaxies, we have stars, they… well, you get the point. So could some galaxies in Hubble deep field images be anti-galaxies? They should look the same… oh, actually, why do we think so? The standard model of particle physics predicts that antimatter should emit the same light as regular matter. If we had a regular star and a star made of antimatter, studying their spectra we wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So if there existed isolated antigalaxies that we were able to see with telescopes, judging only by their starlight, we wouldn't know if they were actually antigalaxies. But what about experimental evidence? Here comes the CERN again. One of the most important instruments of astrophysics is spectroscopy. Every chemical element has its unique spectrum of emission or absorption. This allows us to learn about chemical compositions of stars and other objects remotely, comparing their spectra with the spectra of elements we get in the labs. The simplest, the most abundant and the most studied element in the universe is hydrogen. Its spectrum is measured with very high precision. So scientists try to measure the spectrum of antihydrogen. That's not a trivial task. During the experiment called Alpha 2, millions of created positrons were mixed with tens of thousands of antiprotons. Around 25,000 antihydrogen atoms were created in one run. Then those antiatoms had to be placed in a very special kind of a magnetic trap, special because of antihydrogen properties. And then they had to be held there sufficiently long enough to shine lasers at them and measure their spectrum. The first successful experiment happened in 2016, and it showed that the spectrum of antihydrogen was the same as the spectrum of regular hydrogen. 
In 2018, there was an experiment with higher precision measurements, and the result was still consistent with the first experiment, though the precision of measurements still hasn't reached the level of regular hydrogen. So as far as we can tell, antistars would probably look the same as regular stars for us here on Earth. So perhaps some of the galaxies that we observe could actually be anti-galaxies? Some might think that just by studying radiation, we can't be certain if some of the galaxies are not actually anti-galaxies. But that's not quite true. So far, I've been talking about hypothetical anti-galaxies as if they were isolated. If an anti-galaxy cluster existed somewhere in our observable universe, it could be indistinguishable if it were surrounded by emptiness. I mean, total emptiness. What we would call empty according to our everyday standards is not actually empty. Not interstellar or intergalactic medium, not even voids, vast regions of space almost free of galaxies and stars, even they are not completely empty. Sure, there is like a couple of particles per cubic meter or even less than that, but on a scale of millions of light years that becomes significant. Matter is everywhere. So our hypothetical anti-galaxy cluster should end somewhere, and at the edge antimatter has to meet regular matter. If the antimatter of galactic wind hit regular intergalactic medium at the edge of the anticluster, it would produce gamma rays. At such a scale, we would notice that. So far, nobody has seen anything like this, but that doesn't mean that anti-galaxies don't exist. It just means that we can't see them now. We could also remember that we see not all of the universe, only its observable part. The whole universe is way bigger, if not infinite. Perhaps anti-galaxies are behind the cosmological horizon, but here we have no way of knowing that. Anyway, there were some actual attempts to find anti-galaxies. There is an AMSO2 experiment on the International Space Station. Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer is a cosmic ray detector with several instruments. It's like a modern-day Wilson chamber the size of the small bus. Here is an astronaut for comparison. But obviously there is no supersaturated liquid. It uses, for instance, silicon detectors. It's been gathering data on cosmic rays and also detecting antimatter particles from astrophysical sources for over a decade. The antiparticles are created when black holes or neutron stars tear their companion stars apart, or charged cosmic ray particles collide with each other. Scientists believe that it was unlikely that such events would produce not just particles like positrons, but whole anti-helium nuclei. One of the AMS project managers said that even a single detection of anti-helium might hint at the existence of regions of space where antimatter dominates. And AMS-02 actually registered such signals, well, signal candidates. So far, we're not 100% sure what it might be. There are several options. That can be a result of dark matter annihilation, or actually they may come from anti-stars. But the most boring explanation is detector errors, which is also possible. So in principle, anti-galaxies could exist as far as we know, but we don't have a reason to say that they actually exist, at least in our observable part of the universe. But the research goes on, and even if we never find anti-galaxies, we will still learn a lot about antimatter, hence about the universe itself. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description, and if you really liked the video, I would like to ask you to share it with your friends, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye!